don't know about you guys, but sometimes I think the writer in Mark definitely has issues with the Pharisees. <laughs> and then I think with good reason. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm going to kind of bookend before we have a, a time of communion. I'm going to uh, bookend uh, my message. And so you can, I hope you have your bulletins along with, uh, I'm walking back here because I'm going to tell you what, um, you guys don't see what I see. I see a clock that says 745. And uh, <laughs> uh, it will be 745 for a long time, especially when I came in this morning and saw it was 745, very early in the morning, <laughs> well before 745. Uh, I got the big ladder out and uh, put brand new batteries in the clock and, and discovered the clock had an evil mind of its own and died. <laughs> I don't know how, so maybe not an evil mind. The clock died. Let me just put it that way. It died. No batteries are going to resurrect it. And so I just wanted to get back and make sure that I, I stay on track of time um, for a bunch of reasons. Uh, mo one, being you get hungry at noon. <laughs> and then, uh, unless you came. Even though it was a very small kind of, uh, uh, what do you call, continental breakfast, uh, uh, you know what? You guys leave donuts, and I hate, I'm going to be the one that eats them. So I'm not that hungry at the moment. I've had a, a donut. I'm good. <laughs> but uh, the second thing, well, way more important, may I say it this way, more important than the lunches that we are desiring is a time of communion. And, uh, man... Uh, I'm excited. I, I get, I'm excited about communion. I'm excited about communi communion in the same sense as I'm excited about baptism. Baptism, you're going under the water and coming up. So you're telling everyone, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. What was dirty is washed away and it is clean and this body's going to stay clean and you see it so you can hold me accountable to the cleanliness so that and it's the same way just so you know if you're baptized I look at it the same way you're telling me that you're a follower of Jesus Christ so follow him and I will hold you accountable to it not I will hold you in restrictions of it or limitations of it it's like an accountability a love accountability and so I love that along with communion because communion to me it is not a ritual of of a certain Sunday that you do it but it is this this, this reminder of, and we'll get into it, man, my Savior, he broke the bread. He had the cup that he uh, held up when he was showing his disciples, this is my body broken for you. This is the cup of the new covenant with God's people that will be done by the shedding of my blood. And then if you go into Corinthians, because I was telling you a story and I believe it was Luke, you go into Corinthians where Paul's like, just a reminder to the church, you got to be, know this. This is how it's passed down. This is what it's about. And you tell people until he comes again about the Savior who died on the cross for you. It rages an excitement within me when I come in and see um, the, the, the platters on the, on the communion table already placed for the majority of it. And you know what? It, it is, well, because it reminds me of the Lord of the Sabbath. Uh, and, and we're going to get into that really deep. The Lord of the Sabbath, like I said, to help you have your bulletins along, uh, along with going to Mark chapter 2. Chapter 2, we're at the very bottom of the chapter because we're going to go into the very top of chapter 3. And, and just, again, two stories that go along with what we're talking about this morning. But in your bulletins, in your bulletins, talking about the Lord of the Sabbath, I'm going to bookend it. Bear with me for a moment because to understand the, have the understanding of this Lord of the Sabbath, I am standing on the promises. Of who? Of Christ my King. I'm standing on the promises of the Lord of the Sabbath. Doubts and fears will assail. I cannot fall. See, 
knowing the Lord of the Sabbath, you have people who uh, their greatest excuse is, and I, you know, I even find myself uh, trying to comfort individuals. You know what? We all make a mistake. We all have that, that failing sometimes within our life. Um, but I always say this, as I try to comfort those who have fallen, who have made the mistake, know this. You might have fallen and made the mistake, but there is still and will always be the Lord of the Sabbath that brings about forgiveness. See, this is what excites me, that when I stand on these promises, man, I cannot fall. You know why I can't fall? Because the Lord of the Sabbath will direct my steps. I have a hope. This is, in fact, you can even do it. The song, the song is, we have a hope. Boy, you get to be included in my enthusiasm. We have a hope. Greater than, than what? Greater than, uh, shh, we have a hope within us of the life beyond the grave. You know why? Because the Lord of the Sabbath came up out of the grave. The Lord of the Sabbath is Lord over death. There, you go in scripture, death, where is thy sting? You know, there is no sting of death with the Lord of the Sabbath. And I have that hope. I have that hope when I walk the straight and narrow way. There's a, a, a brighter and brighter day. Oh, man. Life will end. Did you, did, life will end with joyful singing. Does that just sound like two opposite things? Life will end. Those who do not know the Lord of the Sabbath, it is such a nightmare, such a tragedy, such sorrow, such such emptiness and loneliness for us that that follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the Lord of the Sabbath. Life will end in joyful singing. How does that take place? Because you know what? This breath might stop for just a second. And the next second, it'll be joyful singing in the presence of the Lord of the Sabbath. See, people... Whew, and I'm going to tell you this. The Lord of the Sabbath is involved in my finances. The Lord of the Sabbath is involved in my talents. The Lord of the Sabbath is involved in everything that I am, and therefore it is easy to give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks. Why? Because I serve, as Brother Bud said so beautifully, Jesus Christ, the Son. <laughs> I'm going to stop for just a second. When my king shall call for me, may he find me in my place. When my king, when the Lord of the Sabbath calls me, man. If, we, if I wanted, I could, uh, in a cheery way, let me toil each day. Toil. <laughs> there's some words that kind of, if you struggle with work, there's some words that just kind of, uh, I am not toiling. First of all, we live, uh, you know, I know some of you inlanders are used to this, but us coastliners, when it hits 75 or above, man, I'm starting to sweat again. And, 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 and so that toiling brings about a labor that brings about perspiration, that brings about, oh, when will it be over? But yet here, in a cheery way, I will toil each day. Why is that? Because I am following the Lord of the Sabbath. He leads my steps every moment. And in that, when I'm working or when I'm resting, in all of that, my king will call for me. Man. See, so when you don't know Jesus Christ that way, you will never, ever get it. I'm sorry. I, I don't mean to be so brutally blunt about it, but you just won't get it. You'll, you'll read words, and you'll come to church, and, 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 and that'll be kind of like a part of your life, but it will not be life. You, it, it, there is a, a dear saint, I was thinking of her uh, in my studies times, that uh, her and her husband, great, they, as I was beginning uh, my full-time ministry, they, they were 
so very supportive and, and, uh, and brought up kids to know the Lord and stuff. And uh, she had a saying, this, and she's still with us. She had a, stay, a saying, and she probably got it from somebody else. It was probably way before her time even maybe, or maybe not, because McDonald's was only around a little bit. But walking into a building such as this, a church, does not make you a Christian. Just like walking into McDonald's does not make you a burger. And for some people, they're like, what do you, that is the simplest mentality of the thought process of following the Lord of the Sabbath. Just because you walk into a building does not make you a follower of Christ. Just because you walk into a building and maybe even hold a Bible in front of the pews or hold a hymnal or whatever, it does not make you a follower of Christ until this right here says, I want to be a follower of Christ. Forgive me for the things that are dirty, the things that are not not about you God forgive me of those things and walk help me with my steps and that makes you a follower of Christ just like walking into McDonald's does not make you a Big Mac a quarter pounder a cheeseburger or the double cheeseburgers or anything like that or any kind of shake because guess what sometimes sometimes happens at McDonald's the shake machine doesn't work and when you're on the coast and it's hot like this you want to shake and it doesn't work it is not the same as being a follower of Christ. And that's where I, I just had to do that kind of an introduction to me to have an understanding of the Lord of the Sabbath. Mark chapter 2, starting at verse 23. One Sabbath day, as Jesus was walking through some grain fields, his disciples began breaking off the heads of grain to eat. But the Pharisees said to Jesus, Look, why are they breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? I want to stop here for just a moment. A couple of things. And, and it, it, it almost be like break, breakneck speed because there's just so much. And it, it, everything just kind of triggers me. First of all, they're walking through the grain field. Pastor Mark and I were talking about this a little bit this morning. It, it reminds me of this. You know what? When I played softball, um, we had a dugout. And in the dugout, they banned chew. Okay? They banned uh, the, the lip stuff for the ball players who couldn't play ball, but they could spit it. <laughs> and so they banned it from the dugout. Why was that? Because it was just gross. I was telling Pastor Mark, it was just gross on the dugout floor. But then these guys, they decided this, that they would just grab a handful of sunflower seeds and toss them in. And then to pass the time, they would use their teeth and their tongue, you know, and they could do it. They were good. And they eat the seed and spit the shell out. So instead of chewing, now we had these just nasty, wet shells of sunflower seeds. See, I had to tell you that because sometimes when I read stories in the scriptures, I'm like, I can understand what it means to walk through a grain field and shh, like that off this little stalk, and all of a sudden you have this stuff that came out of, that's got to be separated just a little bit to get that meaty piece of grain. And these disciples, they were eating it as they were going through. Now, can I be funny for just a moment? Because the Pharisees are like, hey, why are they breaking the law by, in my scripture text, harvesting grain on the Sabbath? And in my head, are you ready? First of all, walking through the field and going like this and going, mm, 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 that's not harvesting. See, and I, and I love it because we're in September. September, my heart goes to the mountain because on the mountain is harvest season for apples because of where we're at and or or pumpkins which if you came to breakfast guess what was down there pumpkin there's like a pumpkin bread of some sort in the ring was down and, and not my heart jumped i'm like oh that's right it is harvesting season and so that means we go up to the mountain and we have our apples and and our apple burritos and and apple pies this tall which i've never had but i've seen them in the store up on the on glen oak i believe it's called apple pies you think i'm lying that big i don't know how they get it to rise but it is that big it's really weird to see that's that's not harvesting 
you got to get the big old John Deere with that stretches almost as wide as this church. And you got this big old thing. And you got your CD player or MP3 player, whatever they're doing now, air conditioning. And they're riding in luxury. That's harvesting. Why are they breaking the law by harvesting? And the Pharisees, they really want to nail Jesus and his disciples. So they, and they know the law. They have studied, I told you this last week, the, the book of Moses. So therefore, we have it in our pocket right here. You know, if you go back to the book of Moses in Exodus, or for us, or if you go back to the book of Moses, which is Leviticus for us, if you go back there, you will find that there is a law that you cannot harvest on the Sabbath. Jesus says to them, haven't you ever read the scriptures? Well, before I do that part, <laughs> if you were to go to Leviticus chapter 25, this thing about what is right and what is wrong on the Sabbath, Aaron, the priest, and his sons in this priestly line needed to have their needs met as in eating. And so in Leviticus, they, the law was to, to do this bread up. And it's the bread to be in the presence of the Lord. And so it, has, it, it had like frankincense poured on it. And it was done a certain way. It had certain little restrictions and rules on how to make this bread and bring it to the temple. You put it in the temple. And it goes into the temple. And then Aaron and his sons get to take what is a holy bread and eat it. And so if, when the bread was stale because of the law, they would make new bread and then they'd bring in the new bread and they'd place it in the temple. And then when that bread got stale, they would... It, it, and so it was like a, a, a daily or weekly event where they brought this bread and placed it so that Aaron, the priest, would have bread to eat and his sons would have bread to eat holy bread in the presence of the Lord and so now the Pharisees come up with this thought process of later on all these rules and regulations that you cannot harvest on the Sabbath and so then Jesus comes with this story haven't you ever read in the scriptures what David did when he and his companions were hungry It is a very cool story. It's found in 1 Samuel chapter 21. Um, I say a cool story. Man, I debated on it because it's, David actually lies. He tells a story. Saul, if you remember, Saul wanted to kill David. And if you were here months ago or whatever, I told the story where uh, Jonathan, David's best friend, they decided... David's like, your dad's going to kill me. He hates, he hates me. And, and Jonathan's like, my dad, my dad loves you. He ain't going to do nothing to you. And so they talk together. And Jonathan's like, well, I'm going to tell you what. I'm going to really, really find out. Remember that part of the story? And if my dad's going to kill you, I'll shoot an arrow. It'll go way past where you're at. That means run, David. He's going to kill you. So yes, that took place. Yes, Saul wanted to kill David. Yes, David ran. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 21, David is still on the run from King Saul. And he's hungry. He's hungry. And he goes to the temple. He meets the, the priest, Abathar or Ambalek, one of those priests. And the priest is kind of freaking out because he sees David coming by himself. This is all 1 Samuel chapter 21. Well, what's up? And David begins to tell this story while well, I'm on a, on a secret mission for King Saul. <laughs> uh, do you have any food here? <laughs> and this priest says this. We don't have any food. The only thing we have, ready, is the holy bread that is placed in the presence of the Lord. Can I have it? <laughs> and the priest gives David, who thinks David's on a secret mission for the king, the bread. To what? 
to eat and for his other guys to eat. If you read, and I'm going to go on in just a sec, because I read all of 21, and one of the po cool parts before David is about to leave with the bread is this. Hey, you got any weapons? And the priest goes, man, we don't have no weapons, but the only thing we have, are you ready? Is the sword of Goliath, the one that you killed. <laughs> and David's response is, there ain't no better sword than that. I'll take it. And so he takes the sword and the bread. That's chapter 21 in 1 Samuel. The reason I say that, I want you to grasp this. The need of David was met with what would be considered by the Pharisees unlawful. Okay? David was not designed or in the line to eat that bread. But the need was met. And so Jesus, this is what's cool. Jesus tells a story. Haven't you ever read that story where this bread was what you would call unholy because of who you are? So you've taken a few little grains of, of wheat out of the field as you're walking by, unlawful. And, and Jesus is like, haven't you ever read that story? And Jesus says to them, the Sabbath, I'm at verse 27 in chapter 2, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of the people and not the people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. Son of man is Lord, even over the Sabbath. See, uh, this is, and, and I love the writer of Mark because he's about to walk into chapter 3, those few verses. We had to grasp this understanding of who is the Lord of the Sabbath. Who is the one where your rules and regulations, I understand them, but you cannot allow them to supersede the needs of the people and make up your stuff because I'm gonna, the Son of Man, the Son of God says, just so you know, the Sabbath was made for people. Man, I love that. Because that those those pharisaical thought processes have not left the world today. Now, I'm gonna say in some of it, it's kind of like cool. People will twist it. You should not work on the Sabbath. So all you people who are working on Sundays, you're going straight to hell. Well, wait, wait a minute here. Pharisaical law. <laughs> because you should not walk so far. You should not, grant, quote, harvest so much. You should, not, you should not do this on the Sabbath or that on the Sabbath. And so because you're all doing that stuff on the Sabbath, you're going straight to hell. You know who's not going straight to hell? The leader of Chick-fil-A. <laughs> Unless you're a Chick-fil-A lover, they are not open right now. <laughs> or, or, you know what? And I, I used to do art as a camp, uh, a camp counselor and director for, for, uh, for youth in the church in Illinois. And so one of the greatest things of finding art supplies, ready? Hobby Lobby, another place that's not going to hell because they're not open today either. Now, the problem is, you have people that have that pharisaical thought process. You know why they're closed? Because it is the Sabbath. <laughs> you know why they're closed? Because it is a Sunday. You know why they're closed? And, and, and Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath, is saying, you know what? You've missed it. Because if you talk to these leaders of both of these organizations, in fact, I, I, the beautiful one is Hobby Lobby. Because if you go straight to the doors of Hobby Lobby you will find out it is not about a pharisaical thought process. We are closed on Sundays. It is we are closed on today so that our workers have the opportunity. We do not make them, but they have the opportunity to worship with their families. That is an understanding of the Sabbath is made for people, and people are not made for the Sabbath. Chick-fil-A, the, the, not only does, do they not work on Sunday, people are going, oh, that's the pharisaical. Do not work on Sunday. You've missed it. Because in all of them allowing families to worship also on Sunday, get this, 
They are the number one fast food restaurant in the nation, and they are the most profitable fast food uh, restaurant in the nation who does not work one day of those weeks. While everyone else, McDonald's, I told you you can't be a, you can't be a, follow, a, a cheeseburger if you walk into McDonald's. While all these other people are trying to make the profit, you have another one saying, you know what, profit is not what it's about. It's about the Savior and the opportunity for you to worship the Lord of the Sabbath. And then look how God has blessed them. Hobby, Hobby Lobby has not closed no matter who has, who has uh, come up against it because they have come up against Hobby Lobby to protest. Chick-fil-A, protest. I, I remember the one time where uh, a couple of years ago, protest Chick-fil-A, and they had the greatest profit they had in all of their year on that one single day. Following the Lord of the Sabbath. See, we have to have an understanding. The Sabbath was made for people, not the people for the Sabbath. Chapter 3. Jesus, well, before I, I go into chapter 3, now we have this understanding of the Lord of the Sabbath. Chapter 1, chapter 2, going into chapter 3. Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath, is the greatest teacher. Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath, is the greatest teacher example. Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath, is the greatest healer. Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath, is Lord. Chapter 3, six verses. Jesus went into the synagogue again. Remember I said about example. <laughs> Jesus went into the synagogue again and notice a man with a deformed hand. Since it was the Sabbath, Jesus' enemies watched him closely. If he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the deformed hand, and I, you know what? Sometimes Jesus is, he, he's cool in such a way of, because he's Lord. <laughs> hey, you, come here. <laughs> You see all these people? We got the Pharisees. I know they're around because I'm going to get to them in verse 6. But we got the Pharisees, the those people. And we got the enemies. We, that's how Mark put it, the enemies. And we got these other people that are here in the synagogue. Welcome to the synagogue. Oh, you. Come here. Stand in the middle with me. <laughs> there is no denying the Lord of the Sabbath. There is no denying the Lord who heals. You, I want you to come center stage. I want you to come in the presence of everyone where nobody is going to miss this. And he turns to the critics and he says, asks, does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath? Or is it a day of doing evil? Does this day, is this the day to save a life or destroy it? And just like what was said in, in another, uh, in our readings that we had this morning, and they're silent. They refuse to answer. Can, can you imagine? Because if you say do good, whoa, on the Sabbath, do good. Or if you say do evil on the Sabbath, whoa, evil on the Sabbath, to, to destroy somebody on the Sabbath, or do, do I bring life and save them on the Sabbath? Shh. So he looks around at them with indig indignation. Ready? Just so, because I looked it up. I want to be absolutely positive. Because one was angrily, one was indignation. And, and I just wanted to really, what, how is he looking at these people? How is this writer trying to present how he is looking at them? And it is with this, with strong displeasure, because they are, there's something that, this, that he's seen that is unjust. 
If you want me to kill somebody, that's unjust. If you want me to do evil, that's unjust. If there's good to be done and you tell me not to do it, that's unjust. And so he looks at them with just such displeasure because you've got it so messed up. It's offensive what you're saying. It's insulting what you're saying. And, 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 and so it's a righteous anger that he has. And what? He's deeply saddened. Because their hearts are hard. He looks at the man. Hold your hand out. Man holds his hand out. And it was restored. Now again. Exclamation point. That's my scripture. Exclamation. It was restored. For all you that Oh, it's restored. No, his hand. See, we don't grasp it because my hand is kind of okay or this is okay or that is okay. This man struggled with his hand. That's why he's brought front and center with all of this that's around him and he was restored. Yes. At once, the Pharisees went away, met with supporters of Herod, the Herodians, in a plot, ready, to kill Jesus. Are you kidding me? This is who we are as a people that say, follow every rule, every, limit, every restriction, every law of God, because they missed it. With Exodus chapter 20, thou shalt not kill. And yet they plot to kill the Lord of the Sabbath. We're about to take communion. Pastor Mark, why don't you come on up because we're very close to, to closing this out. See, I, I, if you were to read other, uh, other, other uh, gospels of this story, you would find where in, in uh, let me help you here, the story is told in such a way of the lawful to heal or not to heal, to destroy or to or, or whatever, and so it comes with which uh, one of you has a sheep. If it falls, I'm in, in Matthew chapter 12. If it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more value is a man than sheep? In Luke chapter 14. I believe that was our scripture uh, for this morning. When it talks about that ox or donkey that's fallen into a, a pit. And Jesus goes deeper. What if your son, let me help you out here. What if your daughter, what if your best friend, what if your wife, what if your neighbor fell into a pit? Ready? Would you not immediately pull them out? In the teachings found here in Mark chapter 2 and 3, you have Jesus who is actually, I mean, I get excited, but in, in a nutshell, here's the presentation. We have people that struggle because they want to hold on to something of a, of a letter of the law that has been written for good. See, don't get me wrong. Everything was written for good. There was, it, it, we look at it now. You know why we look at it now kind of weird? Because the Savior has come. The Lord of the Sabbath has given his life for us. So that the things that were written before, all those, those really restrictive laws... That, that, that brought you in the presence of my life is full of sin in front of the Almighty God, has a Savior that cleanses us from it. And these people, the Pharisees especially, they were allowing these other things to prevent them from seeing the divine purpose of all of it. The Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus, when he talked about their hardened hearts, it was a stubbornness against the workings of God. See, they knew but their hearts were stuck. Uh, uh, this was more important than what God had for us. This is more important than the things that God has in our path. Jesus is the Lord 
of the Sabbath. Let me ask you this as we get ready to sing this, this song before communion. Do you know the Lord of the Sabbath? Because until you do, nothing makes sense. You're like a cheeseburger at McDonald's. It just does not make sense. I cannot grasp it. He is the Lord of our finances. He is the Lord over our place of dwelling. He is the Lord over your healing. And I say it this way. This is one of the things that has hit me in such a way. Um, everyone knows I have a back problem. Um, along with, may I say this? The ones I walk with that also have problems. Peter, bone cancer. Sister Susan, sick. Uh, Cindy's sister, struggling with this life of breath itself coming on. Jesus is Lord. Whether this is healed the way I want it, or this is healed as I follow. And man, that gives me strength. And so, it also opens up the eyes of those that we pray for. On Wednesday, you, one, of the, one of the main things I heard about Wednesday, besides the kids, the kids had fire department up here, or involved. <laughs> Not for the kids, but you had to be here to see that story. Come on Wednesdays. But downstairs, one of the things was, in Colossians, the study that they're doing, it was specific prayers. The Lord of the Sabbath answers every prayer. It might not be the way we like sometimes, but the Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus Christ, His Holy Spirit, God the Father, answers every prayer. A follower of Christ follows every answer. Let us stand as we get ready to sing this song before taking communion. If you, you know Please know the Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus Christ. He is the one who died on the cross to save us from our sins and to draw us closer to the Father. See, when he was talking about these Pharisees and, and the enemies and stuff, it was, it was because they had put up barriers to the Father. And Jesus comes to break down the barriers to the Father. And his Holy Spirit today is the one that leads us in those steps of knowing the Lord of the Sabbath. God, clear our hearts. Make us, help us to know that we are pure because we are yours. Help us know that in every aspect of who we are, you are Lord. May we be broken in such a way of following you, Lord, Lord of the Sabbath, Lord of everything. All authority given to you for the, better, the betterment of us as we follow you. God, we seek out everything. And may we be holy as we prepare for communion. In Jesus' holy name, amen.